Kristen and I am one of the transplant pharmacists here at Massachusetts General Hospital. The purpose of this video is to provide you with an overview of what to expect with regards to the new medications that you're going to have to take after your transplant. As you have likely heard, you will have to take a number of new medications after your transplant. We like to separate these medications into two groups, those that keep your new organ healthy and those that keep you healthy. The medications we give you for your new organ are called anti-rejection medications. They work by lowering your body's immune response. Your immune response is what fights things that your body sees as foreign. This can be your new organ or things that cause infections such as bacteria and viruses. Because your body will not be able to fight off infections very well, we have to give you anti-infective medications. In addition to these medications, you will also likely be taking other medications to prevent side effects of the new medications or other medications that treat chronic conditions that you may have. The first group of medications that we will discuss are the anti-rejection medications or immunosuppressants. There are a number of medications that can be used to prevent rejection after transplant. The most commonly used combination of medications is that of tacrolimus or prograf and a mycophenolate product, which may include Celsept or Myfortic. Most transplant patients also go home on prednisone, but there are a few special cases where we might choose not to use it. When learning about your anti-rejection medications, it is important to familiarize yourself with both the brand and generic name of each of your medications as your healthcare team might use either name. You will have to take anti-rejection medications for the rest of your life, or as long as your transplant organ is functioning. You should never stop any of your anti-rejection medications unless you are told to do so by your transplant doctor or transplant nurse. After your transplant, you will likely have to take multiple anti-rejection medications. It's important to realize that each medication works differently to lower your ability to fight off your new organ, but they all work together. As previously mentioned, your immune response is what protects you from infections and foreign invaders, and these anti-rejection medications are used to lower your immune response. The specific medications that you will receive will likely depend on the type of new organ that you receive in your past medical history. The next few slides will focus on some of the common medications that we use after transplant. The first anti-rejection medication that we are going to talk about is tacrolimus or prograf. This anti-rejection medication is provided in three strengths. Though we typically only send our patients home with the one milligram capsules, or sometimes the 0.5 or half milligram capsules. Very rarely do we use the five milligram capsules, but if you find that you need a very high dose, we may sometimes consider using this higher strength. This medication is given twice a day, specifically every 12 hours. The dose is determined based on drug levels, and your dose may change based on your lab results. However, it's important to realize that if you don't receive a phone call after your lab results, that means good news. You don't need to make any dose changes. In order for us to determine the correct amount of medication in your blood and assess the need to make a dose change, it's very important that when you have your blood drawn, that you wait until after the blood is drawn to take your morning dose of this medication. You should always bring this medication to you with you to the lab so that you can take it after your blood is drawn. You will notice over time that as you get further out from transplant, the frequency of blood draws will decrease. Tacrolimus or Prograf can come with some side effects. When we think about side effects, we often think about them as things that you might feel or things that we might be monitoring for in the long term. Things that people sometimes feel with this medication are tremors, headaches, 
tingling in the hands and feet, and sometimes hair loss or hair thinning. In the long term, things that we are monitoring include your kidney function, where we're looking for increased creatinine levels, and we also monitor your blood sugar and blood pressure. With this medication, it is very important that you are consistent in how you take it with or without food. And that is because food can impact the way the medication is absorbed and may impact your drug levels. This medication also interacts with a number of other medications and some fruits. So it's very important to avoid grapefruit juice or products that contain grapefruit, such as sodas like Fresca, because these products can increase your medication levels. There are also a number of interactions with prescription and over-the-counter medications. Therefore, it's very important to always check with your transplant coordinator, your transplant pharmacist before starting any new medications. The next anti-rejection medication that we will talk about is mycophenolate. Mycophenolate is provided in two different products, Celsept or Myfortic. You will only be taking one of these products, but depending on the type of your organ and the side effects that you might experience with this medication, you may be taking one or the other. We typically only use the 250 milligram capsules of mycophenolate malfatil or Celsept. And when using Myfortic, we typically only use the 180 milligram tablets. This medication is given also twice a day, every 12 hours. This medication can also come with some side effects. Again, I like to think of them as things you might feel and things that we might want to monitor. So things that you might feel, things that we want to know about. These include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and heartburn. Specifically with nausea and vomiting, if you feel so sick that you can't take your medications, your transplant nurse needs to know about this. Also, if you have excessive diarrhea, which we consider more than four, five, six loose watery bowel movements per day, we also probably should know about this because this can increase your tacrolimus levels and it can cause dehydration or potential damage to your kidneys. Things that we will monitor long-term in your labs include your cell counts specifically your white blood cells and maybe your hemoglobin. This medication also should be taken with food to prevent stomach upset. Again, we recommend, as with the previous medication, to just be consistent in how you take it, but often we do find that food can help tolerate the stomach side effects of this medication. There are also some medication interactions with this medication. Ideally, we would like you to try to separate this medication from antacids in certain supplements by at least two hours. But we recognize sometimes the separation of medications into multiple times a day can make taking medications quite difficult. One of the really important interactions with this medication is the fact that it can lower the level of hormones in birth control. And this is very important for women of childbearing potential and you will talk more with your transplant pharmacist about this. But it's important for women of childbearing potential to know that they must use two forms of birth control after transplant. It's also important not to crush, chew, or cut mycophenolate tablets because the product can be considered hazardous to those women who may not be ingesting the medication. The final anti-rejection medication that we're going to talk about is prednisone. Prednisone dosing differs significantly from organ to organ, and how we use it varies significantly from organ to organ. So your specific dose and your specific strength of prednisone will be reviewed with you before discharge by the transplant pharmacist and your transplant nurse. Prednisone is typically only taken once a day usually in the morning, and the dose is decreased over time in what we call a taper. We recommend that you take this medication typically in the morning with food to prevent stomach upset, 
And also just only take it in the morning because if you take it later in the day, it can make sleeping difficult. Prednisone can come with some side effects. I've bolded the ones that are most common and that we often talk about. These include high blood sugar, mood changes, and trouble sleeping. If you've had a history of high blood sugar or diabetes prior to transplant, especially if you weren't taking insulin, it's important to note that you might need insulin after your transplant to manage your diabetes because prednisone, as mentioned, can increase your blood sugar. It's also important to have regular eye exams because prednisone can impact um, your eyes and your vision and you want to have your eye doctor looked for cataracts. As I mentioned, the medications that we just reviewed are the most common anti-rejection medications, but not everybody tolerates these medications. Therefore, there are a number of other medications that we might choose to use that would be better for you based on how you're doing. The first one I want to mention is called Inversus. This is an extended release tacrolimus tablet. This is sometimes an alternative to twice daily tacrolimus for people who might have some tacrolimus related side effects. Other alternatives to tacrolimus might include cyclosporin or neural or bilatacept or Neulogix, which is an infusion medication. If you do not tolerate mycophenolate products, we might consider switching you to azathioprine or imuran or to sirolimus or rapamune or possibly everolimus or zortress. Both sirolimus and everolimus can also be used as alternatives to tacrolimus. I know this sounds quite confusing. There's a lot of medications, but the important thing for you to know is that we have a lot of tools in our toolbox and every patient is different. So we will work with your transplant team to find the medication that is best suited for you. Before we move on to the next section, I want to summarize the most important points about your anti-rejection medications. First, you will have to take at least two to three medications to prevent rejection of your new organ for the rest of your life. This again is for as long as your organ is functioning in your body. There are a number of drug interactions with medications, if possible. We would like you to try to separate antacids and certain supplements from your mycophenolate products by at least two hours. Mycophenolate products can be toxic to people who do not take them orally. For that reason, we do not want people handling these products and cutting and crushing them, particularly if they are of childbearing potential. Finally, the most important point is to make sure that you take your anti-rejection medications exactly as directed by your doctor. The next section of transplant medications that we're going to discuss are the anti-infective medications. You will potentially take up to three different types of anti-infective medications. They work to prevent general infections as well as different types of pneumonia. The first anti-infective medication that you might take is called Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. If you have a sulfa allergy or if by chance you do not tolerate Bactrim, there are two alternatives that we might consider, including Dapsone or Atovaquam. We also use medications to prevent viral infections. These may include Valgancyclovir or Valcite or Famcyclovir or Famvir. Not all transplant patients go home taking medications to prevent fungal infections. Typically, it is just usually our heart and lung transplant patients, but in rare cases, we may send other abdominal transplant patients home on these medications. The choice of the fungal medication that you will go home on will depend on a number of factors, including your risk for fungal infection and your prior exposure to antifungal medications. So why do I need to take these anti-infective medications? As previously mentioned, you are at a much higher risk of infection because of the anti-rejection medications that we are giving you. As previously mentioned, these medications 
lower your body's immune response. Your immune response is what protects you from all of these bad bacteria and viruses. And these anti-infective medications are being used to help prevent these infections that you are at a very high risk for after your transplant. What's important to note is that these anti-infective medications are usually temporary. They often taper off over the first year after your transplant. The first anti-infective medication we will talk about is Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. This is typically used to prevent a bacterial infection that often occurs in the lungs. In patients who cannot tolerate Bactrim due to a sulfa allergy or other side effects related to Bactrim, we may consider use of Dapsone or Tovaquam. When talking about Bactrim specifically, this medication is typically dosed as one tablet once a day. If your kidney numbers are slightly off, we might consider giving this medication every other day. Most transplant patients are taking this medication for six months to a year after their transplant, and it is then able to be tapered off. This medication comes with minimal side effects. Things that you might look for are sun sensitivity, which is another reason why it's very important to use sunblock after transplant, SPF 30 to 50 at a minimum, because of the increased risk of skin cancer and sun sensitivity, in particular with this medication. The other things that we are monitoring include elevated potassium and low white blood cell counts. There are two antiviral medications that we may consider using after your transplant. The choice to use one or the other is based on your risk for certain types of viral infections. Most transplant patients go home taking valgancyclovir or valcite. This medication is provided as a 450 milligram tablet, and most patients take either one or two tablets once a day. However, our lung transplant patients usually take this medication twice a day. More often than not, it is one pill twice a day. But as kidney function changes, the dose of this medication can change. We usually have our transplant patients taking this medication for three to six months after transplant. However, after lung transplant, the duration may be much longer. Things that we are monitoring include your white blood cell count and other lab parameters. If you're very low risk for viral infections, we may consider using famciclovir. This medication is provided as 250 milligram tablets and is typically only taken as one or two pills once a day. Again, this medication dose may be adjusted based on your kidney function and you will only have to take this medication for three months. This medication is very well tolerated with minimal side effects. After your transplant, you might have to take medications to prevent fungal infections or thrush in your mouth. Your transplant team will specifically tell you if you have to take an antifungal medication. Antifungal medications on this slide are broken up into two categories, those that are topical versus those that get into your blood and prevent a systemic infection. Nystatin is a liquid that is used to prevent thrush in the mouth and the throat. The most important point with nystatin is that after you swish it around in your mouth and swallow it, you should not eat or drink for 20 minutes after each dose. Our lung transplant patients are sometimes told not to swallow their nystatin. You will have to follow the directions provided by your nurse. Our lung transplant patients also sometimes have to use nebulizers to prevent fungus infections in their lungs. Again, your transplant nurse or transplant pharmacist will tell you if you have to use this medication. There are three different oral antifungal medications that our heart or lung transplant patients might have to go home on. The choice of each medication or the choice to use one of these medications is determined based on your risk of fungus infection. It's very important that you follow the direction provided 
on how to take this medication with or without food. It is also important to note that all three of these medications can affect your anti-rejection medication levels. So it is extremely important that you do not run out of this medication. As if you run out of these medications, your anti-rejection medication levels can get very low and you can be at an increased risk for rejection. To summarize, after transplant, you will be taking a number of medications to prevent different types of infection. These medications are all often temporary and typically are stopped within the first year after your transplant. There may be exceptions to this, however. If using nystatin, it's important to not eat or drink for 15 to 20 minutes after each dose of this medication. The next section of medications that we will talk about are your supplements or other medications. After your transplant, it's extremely important to tell all of your healthcare providers that you are taking anti-rejection medications. This is important because a number of other medications can impact the way your anti-rejection medications work in your body. Some medications can increase the levels of your anti-rejection medications, causing toxic side effects, and others may decrease them, increasing your risk of rejection. That's why it is super important to let your transplant coordinator know about any new medications any other providers may want to start. After your transplant, it's important to note that supplements and other medications are readily available. Most of these medications are available at the pharmacy without a prescription. However, as a transplant patient, not all over-the-counter products are safe. We prefer that our transplant patients do not use any herbal products. This is because of the potential for interactions with the transplant medications, as well as the risk for boosting your immune system, which may lead to rejection. We suggest that you always check with your transplant coordinator or transplant pharmacist before taking any over-the-counter medication. We always want to encourage you to read the labels of all of your products. Grapefruit juice is often included in many fruit juice blends and other sodas such as Fresca. And as previously mentioned, grapefruit juice or grapefruits can also cause interactions with your anti-rejection medications. There are a number of supplements and over-the-counter medications that we know are safe. This table does provide a summary of some of the safe supplements, and over-the-counter products. These include calcium, which should be separated from your mycophenolate by at least two hours if possible, vitamin D, multivitamins, biotin, aspirin, again at low doses to protect your heart, and medications to prevent heartburn, such as famotidine and ritididine, or omeprazole, pantoprazole, and lansoprazole. One of the most common questions that we receive about over-the-counter medications is what over-the-counter medication is safe for pain? Our preferred over-the-counter pain medication is acetaminophen or Tylenol. We do, however, have dose limits for the different organ groups. We prefer that our liver transplant patients do not take more than 2,000 milligrams of acetaminophen in 24 hours. All other organs we suggest abide by the labeling requirements of not to exceed more than 3,000 milligrams of acetaminophen in 24 hours. We do suggest that the vast majority of all of our transplant recipients avoid the following over-the-counter pain medications. These pain medications are considered NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. All of these medications have the potential to cause significant kidney damage when taken in combination with your tacrolimus or prograf or your cyclosporin. The medications listed here, including ibuprofen, aspirin, 
naproxen, high dose aspirin included in Excedrin, or the salicylate in Pepto Bismol should all be avoided. To summarize, the most important points about over the counter products one, most insurance companies unfortunately will not cover these. So if you need to use these products, you will likely have to be paying out of pocket for them. We recommend that you only buy over-the-counter products that are recommended by our transplant team. You can find these products listed in your education binder, or you can call us with any questions. If you ever have any questions about the safety of over-the-counter products or supplements, please be sure to call your transplant pharmacist or your transplant coordinator. After your transplant, you will be provided a number of tools and resources to help you manage your medications. One of the most important tools is going to be your medication list. Every patient should always have an up-to-date medication list, and you should bring this list to all appointments. You also have a number of providers that can serve as medication resources for you. Your transplant pharmacist is available in the transplant clinic and can be accessed through your transplant coordinator. Your transplant doctors also can always answer any questions about your transplant medications. The most important tool that you will have to organize your medications is your medication list or your medication card. This slide shows you an example of a blank medication list or medication card. You should receive a copy of your personal medication list within a day or so after your transplant. And you should review this medication list with your nurse every time they bring in your medications. Let's take some time to review the information that you will find on your medication list. We will start with the top right corner. In this corner, you will find your name and your medical record number, your medication allergies or intolerances, and the specific number that you should call if you have any questions. This number may be different for you depending on what type of transplant you receive. This number may not be the number that is on this slide. We also make note on this card of when the medication card was last modified. So you can always keep track of which medication card is the most up to date. The next section of the medication card illustrates the key points. We wanna make sure you bring this card with you to every clinic appointment. As previously mentioned, we wanna make sure that you don't take your prograph or tacrolimus the morning of your blood draw you want to make sure you bring it with you so you can take it after the blood is drawn so we can get an accurate medication level. The third point is that we want to make sure that you use prescription bottles only for the name of the pills and the strength of each tablet and capsule. This is because the instructions on the pill bottle aren't always up to date. This is the purpose of your medication list and your medication card. This product product is what we will keep up to date with all of your current medication doses. We also want to make sure that you call us with any questions about refills or medications. The next portion of your card will be the medication grid. This is set up in three sections, which will align with how we reviewed the medications earlier in this presentation. The first section is your anti-rejection medications or the immunosuppressants. The second section is the infection prevention or anti-infective medications. And then the third section is the other medications or supplements. You will see that the third section, other medications, continues on to the second page. This is where we also list the as needed medications and your pain medications if you need to take them. And we also have some of the key points that I also already reviewed during this presentation. You will see when looking at your medication card that it is broken up into multiple columns. This first column lists the medication name, both brand and generic name. Given that most of these medications are available as generic products, it's important to note that the generic name 
the name without the trademark symbol is the name that will likely be on your medication bottle. The next column is the purpose of the medication and what it's used for. The third column tells you how long you will typically be taking the medication. And the fourth column lists special considerations. The next slide is an illustration of what your medication card will look like when it is typically filled out. We usually fill this medication card out with pencil so that you can adjust the medication doses. Again, this example is only to introduce you to the layout of the medication list. The specific dosing information on this medication card will be very different from what you go home with. You can see on this medication card that we also added in suggested times to take your medications. This may be adjusted over time to meet your specific needs and to align with the timing of your labs. The dose that is written in the row is the dose of the medication that you will take at this specific time. Let's start with the Dacrolimus. As previously mentioned, this medication is typically provided in multiple strengths. Let's assume for this example that you only have one milligram capsules. You can see that your dose of this medication is two milligrams in the morning and two milligrams in the evening. Again, 12 hours apart at 8 in the morning and 8 at night. Because you only have 1 milligram capsules, that means that for your dose of 2 milligrams, you will have to take 2 1 milligram capsules in the morning and again, 2 1 milligram capsules in the evening at 8 o'clock. Remember, on days that you get labs, you want to make sure that you do not take this medication until after your blood draw. Let's move on to the next medication, your mycophenolic acid or myfortic. This medication is provided as 180 milligram tablets. Your dose in the morning and in the evening will be 540 milligrams. 540 milligrams divided by 180 milligrams is three. Therefore, to make 540 milligram dose, you will take three 180 milligram tablets in the morning and in the evening. And you can take these at the same time as your other morning medications. The last anti-rejection medication that you might take is your prednisone. Your dose is 20 milligrams. Let's assume that you have five milligram tablets. If this is the case, you will take four tablets in the morning only to make 20 milligrams. And remember, you always wanna look at your tablet size on the bottle because you may not have five milligram tablets. It's important to also notice with your prednisone that this medication is only written in the morning column. It is not in the evening column. This means you only take this medication in the morning, not at night. Let's move down to your infection prevention medications. The first medication here is your trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or Bactrim. This one can sometimes be confusing because it's got a very long name and the name is often too long to fit on the medication bottle. But when you think about how it's dosed, it's pretty simple pretty much always one tablet. We don't really talk about milligrams. It's easier just to refer to it being a single strength tablet that you almost always just take one pill once a day. You might take this medication every other day if you have kidney problems. The next antiviral medication that you would take is potentially Valgan Cyclovir. As previously mentioned, you might take a different antiviral called famcyclovir, but again, your doctor will determine which antiviral is best for you. Let's assume that your dose of this medication is 450 milligrams, again, filled in once, so this is once a day. This medication is provided as 450 milligram tablets, 
Therefore, you will only take one tablet. Heart and lung transplant recipients often have additional medications listed here that prevent fungus. Lung transplant patients often also have other medications that they might use via nebulizer listed here, in addition to the antibacterial and antiviral medications. Your transplant pharmacist or nurse will describe all of these additional medications to you at the time of discharge. The final medication on this list is omeprazole. And this medication is often used to prevent stomach problems that may occur with the use of some of your other medications. This medication for our abdominal patients is typically only continued for one month, whereas with lung transplant patients, it's often continued for a much longer period of time. The remaining rows are often filled in with other medications that you may need for blood pressure or other medications that you may take for chronic disease states. At the time of discharge, we typically work with a local Walgreens pharmacy to supply your medications for delivery at bedside. The Walgreens pharmacy on Stanhope Street will deliver all of your medications in addition to a wellness kit. This wellness kit typically includes a pill box, a blood pressure cuff, a pill splitter, as well as a thermometer and other necessities such as sunblock. It's important to note that the Walgreens Pharmacy will call you before you leave the hospital to review your medication doses and to obtain payment. Therefore, it's really important to always have a credit card on hand as they will need to process this credit card for payment if you have any copays. Additionally, a member of the transplant team will take the time to review your medications with you prior to discharge and will confirm that you understand how to follow your medication card and identify each medication. As mentioned with your wellness kit, the wellness kit will contain a pill box. Pill boxes are super helpful for helping you organize your medications. They also serve as a great double check. If you put your medications in your pill box and you find that the medication is still sitting in there in the morning and you weren't sure whether you took your medications or not, it's pretty much a guarantee that you probably did not take it if it's still in that day slot. If it's not in the slot, then that usually serves as your proof that you took your medication for that day. After your transplant, taking your medications is the most important thing to do to guarantee the success of your organ. Never stop taking your transplant medications or change the dose of your medications unless you are told to do so by your transplant coordinator or transplant doctor. Medication adherence is extremely important. When we use the word adherence, it means taking your medications exactly as your healthcare provider tells you to do so. Not being adherent or non-adherent we know leads to an increased risk of patients experiencing organ rejection or infection. There are a number of reasons why some patients might struggle with taking their medications as prescribed. Sometimes it's just by accident and people are just confused. We always want to make sure that you feel comfortable calling or emailing your transplant coordinator if you're not clear on any instructions. We know our medications after transplant can sometimes be really expensive, and we have ways that we can help you. Please make sure that if you are unable to pay for your medications or you're having difficulty affording your medications, that you reach out to us immediately. We can work with you to identify prescription plans that might be more beneficial, or we might even be able to get free drug from the manufacturer to help you afford your medications. Another reason why people sometimes struggle with taking their medications is because they run out of medications. We always want to remind you that it is super important to call us if you are running low on medications or if you don't have refills to ensure that you actually can refill your medication at the pharmacy. You always want to, if you have refills on your prescription, you always want to make sure you call the pharmacy 
when you have at least five to seven days of medications left for them to refill. One of the other reasons why people sometimes don't take their medications is because of side effects. And we always want to encourage you to talk about side effects with us so that we can adjust your medications to medications that you will tolerate and that work for you. Never, ever stop taking medications because you don't feel good. We have other medications that may be better for you that we just need to know about. We recognize that sometimes people do miss doses. It's important if you do miss a dose of your medication that you take the medication immediately when you remember. We also recognize that sometimes in some of our clinics, we tell you to hold your medication until after the lab draw and the lab draw can be later in the day. If you find that you're taking a medication later in the day, you wanna make sure that you separate the medications that are twice a day medications, such that they are at least always six to eight hours apart. An example here would be, say you take your medication typically at eight in the morning and eight at night. You realize at three o'clock in the afternoon that you did not take your eight o'clock medication. You take it immediately at three o'clock in the afternoon and then you push your eight o'clock dose back to after nine. So it's at least six hours apart from your three o'clock dose. And then you get back on your every 12 hour routine the next day. If you miss a once a day medication, we do not want you to double dose and take more than one dose per day. There are a number of ways that you can remember to take your medications. We always encourage patients to use medication apps or even just a simple watch with an alarm on it or the alarm on your smartphone. All of these tools serve as helpful reminders for our patients to remember to take their medications. Medication storage is also important to ensure that your medications do not lose their potency. You want to keep your medications in a cool, dry place that is easily accessible to you. We don't want to have you store them in places that have rapidly changing temperatures and moisture, such as bathrooms, kitchens, and cars. It's really important to always be proactive about your medication refills. If you're on your last refill of a medication, or if you run out, you want to make sure that you call the transplant center or send a gateway message during office hours. Refills for your transplant medications are typically only given by the transplant center and are not usually given through your primary care doctor. With many of us living in New England, it's important to always expect the unexpected. You always want to plan ahead for emergency events such as a blizzard or hurricane and make sure that you never run out of your medications. If you are planning on a vacation, it's also important to think about asking for an extended vacation override so you can acquire a larger supply of your medications. Our final take home messages for our last section include the need to always have a list of important phone numbers handy. These phone numbers include your transplant center, your pharmacy, and your doctor's contact information. You also always want to keep an up-to-date medication list handy. You can keep this medication list on your phone. You can keep the Massachusetts General Patient Gateway on your phone. This can serve as an updated medication list. Or you can keep a medication list printed in your bag. You always, always, always want to have an up-to-date medication list when you are admitted to the hospital. And finally, it is very important that you call for medication refills one week before you run out of medications. Ideally, at all times, you want to always call your transplant coordinator before your medication prescription runs out of refills. I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to call us. Your phone number for your transplant clinic is on your medication list and should also be provided on your discharge paperwork. We hope you found this informational video informative. And if you have any points of feedback, please 
tell them to your nurse. We would love to hear from you. Thank you, and best of luck with your new transplant.